Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, this is going to be part three in the BBC Master 128 series. I recommend you watch part one and then part two first, as we'll be continuing off right after we left off in part two, where I got this machine fully restored and fully working. In this video, I'll be doing several modifications to this video, and I'm actually going to list them out right now in case you're watching this video in the future and you want to jump to any specific mod that I do. I'm going to be putting links in the description below or time jump links so you can jump right to those mods if you so desire. The first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding an SD card interface to this, but unlike probably most videos out there about the SD card interface, I actually built this one myself. I didn't just buy an off-the-shelf one. Next up, I'm going to be doing a mod to this machine to enable color composite video output because the composite video on this computer is black and white normally, and I wanted to be able to select between monochrome and color output at will. After that, I'm going to be doing a mod to this computer where I change the color composite output on this from PAL to NTSC. And that's a little bit of a trick because this computer does run at 50 hertz but I do a mod that actually allows it to display color video through composite on North American monitors, which cannot decode PAL color at all. So with this machine unmodified, we would get a black and white image entirely, but I get this computer working in NTSC. And then after that, I do a mod to the NVRAM and the clock circuit on this thing, where I remove the need to have an external battery pack like was originally in this machine that is totally leak prone. It's a mod I highly recommend everyone who has one of these machines do. That way you eliminate the potential risk of a leaky battery inside your machine, and you'll have a good working clock and NVRAM that should last you a good 10 years. Alrighty, so with all that said, without further ado, let's get right to it. I'm going to start off this video with a caveat saying that many of the things I'm doing here are completely untested, or at least I think they're untested. So they may not work properly or they may not go to plan. So just bear with me on that. Since refurbishing this computer in the last video on it, the machine has been working absolutely perfectly. I haven't really addressed that one key switch over here that hasn't worked properly, but the rest of the keys on this thing are working great. Powering the machine on boots straight into basic here because it's actually working properly, meaning the battery that I installed in this thing is actually working. With the keyboard fully working, I've definitely been able to experiment with this machine a little bit more and basically learn a little bit more about how BBC Basic works. And I think I might have mentioned this in the last video, but I'm going to say it again. As I use this computer more, I'm definitely more and more impressed with it, especially around BBC Basic. It's a really good basic with a lot of really strong capabilities. I won't dwell on it too much in this video because there are a lot of other videos of people who know a lot more about BBC Basic talking about why it's so great, but it is really good and it's impressive on this computer, even though it only runs at two megahertz, how fast and responsive it really is. Let's move on to the very first thing I want to do with this machine, and it's expand its capabilities for running software. Now, what I mean by that is in the last video, I had this thing booting off a three and a half inch floppy disk. And while that's useful, it's not exactly super great. A lot of, lots of people suggested I could hook a GoTech up to this thing and then load software on it. The problem is when you look online to download games and software and stuff for this machine, every single piece of software out there seems to have been dumped onto a disk image that is just that one little single piece of software. Even if it's like something that's 2K, it's just sitting on a disk image. So you're gonna have to load every single one of those disk images onto the GoTech, or at least know what you wanna load onto the GoTech. And because I've never used a BBC Micro, I don't have any familiarity with the software for this thing, it would be much nicer to have something that had all of the software together in one place for easy loading, changing of software packages and stuff like that, instead of having to interface with a GoTech front panel, which is frankly rather annoying. So that brings me to this project right here. It's called MMFS, and it's an open source project for the BBC Micro and the BBC Master, where you can essentially hook up an SD card directly to the user port, which is on the underside of the machine, and then access all the software you could ever possibly want through an SD card. Now, this particular GitHub repo is specifically about the ROM image that you would load into this machine, to then be able to access that interface you plug into the bottom of the computer. 
Here are some of the features, MMC, SD or SDHC card, up to eight gigabytes, FAT32, as well as FAT16. Now right here, it talks about that this supports different SD interface boards. Going back to the readme for this GitHub repo, it talks about it supports a couple different of the interface designs. One designed by Martin Mather in 2006, and a later Turbo MMC interface that is talked about here on a post on Stardock. Now, it seems there are a couple places you can buy these interfaces pre-made. And here's one here on the future was 8-bit ST to BBC, SD or SPI SD card interface. It's about 40 pounds. And then there's shipping as well. And unfortunately, when you ship this to the US, it costs like about, I think around $70 which is kind of expensive for what it is. Not to take away from what the Futures 8-Bit is doing because it has a nice case and stuff like that, but when we look at this particular um, interface here, it's just an SD card essentially hooked directly up to the user port. Now, SD cards run at 3.3 volts and the BBC micro user port or the BBC user port runs at five volts. So you need to do a little bit of level shifting. So five volts here goes through a 3.3 volt regulator to power the SD card. And then you're using some voltage dividers right here to bring down the five volts coming from the computer down to 3.3 volts ish that the card needs. I also found another one of these interfaces sold by someone on eBay. Uh, here's the uh, screenshot of the listing. Now it's out of stock, so it doesn't show up in the search results, uh, but 22 pounds with six pounds uh, shipping and handling, which means it was like, I don't know, it came out to like $40 or something like that US, which is quite a bit cheaper than the one from the future was 8-bit. And the only real difference is this has a little SD card that you stick in underneath the computer. That's a picture there with the machine flipped upside down. And the future was 8-bit one has a wire that goes outside the computer. Now, back on the project repo, there are actually no pre-made schematics for something you can just build. I mean, they have this uh, info right here on that particular interface, and then this later one here, which is a little bit more complicated. And if you go read this thread, it talks about uh, using a couple extra gates. And I think this allows for a little bit faster speeds or something like that, although I can't quite figure out exactly what the difference is. But it seems that uh, both of these interfaces are fully supported by this ROM, and this ROM is still in current active development, so there's no actual reason for me to buy a specific interface. I could actually just try to make my own. There weren't any schematics or uh, really good close-up pictures of those particular ones that were sold online, but from what I could see in the photos, it looks like they were using level shifters instead of using these resistors here to interface the SD card. That really is the right way to do it, but doing it this way actually works fine. So I went into my parts bin and I came up with this, <laughs> which is my really ugly homemade <laughs> one of these interfaces. Now, as I said in the intro here, I haven't tested this. I have no idea if this is gonna work and this might crash and burn. But I looked at my parts bin and I found this SD card reader, which I think was originally for use with Arduinos. So it already had those voltage dividers going on there and the 3.3 volt regulator. So it's essentially doing exactly uh, what the image we were just looking at does when it comes to shifting the signals around from the BBC. The only thing it doesn't have is that protection diode for the output pin that comes out of the ST card going into the BBC. And that's what I've gone ahead and added right there. I did cut this length of ribbon cable, which I had. These are all the pins you actually need. Uh, that is long enough so it can be plugged in underneath the machine and then run outside so I can have this little thing sitting off to the side. If this thing does work, I'll put a bunch of hot glue on this thing to at least uh, keep this a little bit protected. And unfortunately, if I had a 20 pin ribbon cable with the right connector, I would have just used that and cut it. And that way I wouldn't have this uh, sketchy thing here, which I, I cut in half from a larger connector. And uh, yeah, anyways, essentially the way this is wired up though, it's exactly the way this picture right here is wired up. I went and found the smallest SE card I could, which is this really junky one here, eight gigabytes. But uh, according to that GitHub repo, it seemed that that was the maximum size. And the last thing I'm gonna to need to do before testing this little contraption is I need to make the ROM file. So I've gone ahead and downloaded the latest ROM releases here. Let's open the readme file and let's take a look at all the different versions of the ROMs that exist. So we have all these different letters here, user port connected, non-turbo interface. That's what this is. I built it from the old 2006 diagram. There are some other ones that look like they're for the printer interface and things like that stuff I don't need to worry about. So I need the U file. And then we have a couple of different files or versions we need to look at. So we're gonna need the 
MMF or MMFS for the MA for the master. So we're not gonna use the ones for the Model B or the Electron. And then the last difference is there's the MMFS version and the MMFS version two release. And the difference there is the original version, it just uses a single beeb.mmb file, which I happen to have right here. I got sent uh, by one of my friends who's got a BBC master as well. Uh, you copy that onto the SD card, it's a single file, and it contains up to 511 disk images. MMFS2 is a little bit newer and cooler, I guess, and it allows you just to have the raw disk images. It gets rid of the, M, the beeb.mmb file, and then you can just copy the disk images straight onto the SD card. Well, because I already have that file that everything is all combined, I'm gonna use the, MMF, uh, the MMFS version with a U, and we're gonna look specifically for M-A-M-M-F-S. <laughs> That's a lot of letters. Anyways, okay, here we go. Those are the two versions. So MMFS, we're gonna to go to U. Looks like it's this one here. M-A-M-M-F-S dot ROM, 16K. Let me grab an EEPROM. I have a 27C128 loaded in the EEPROM programmer right here. And we're gonna load M-A-M-M-F-S, uh, not dot log. We're gonna load dot ROM. And that should be it. Let's see. What's it doing? There we go. And there it is, loaded up, master, MMFS, 1.54. This should program. <laughs> Let's hope it does. There we go. Now it's funny, with these older chips, it's a 27C128, or I think it's a C version or whatever. Anyways, um, sometimes the, the programming voltage varies compared to what it says in the programming software. Look right here. When I pick this chip from the list, I pick the AMD one that we're using here, it said like 13 volts. But I happen to know after reading the data sheet for this chip, this needs 21 volts. So what I do is I write on it with a Sharpie that it needs 21 volts VPP so that I can go in here and, uh, and change this <laughs> to more successfully program this. Because if you try to program this particular chip at 13 volts, which is what this software defaults to, it won't program. Always go check the data sheet first on the chip you're programming, especially if it's hopefully not a rebadged one. This is a real one I took out of a, an old computer or whatever and then you can write on it to say what the programming voltage is. Another top tip with these types of programmers is they're not always the best when it comes to programming. So I recommend you actually program them multiple times. Notice it programs quicker on the second pass, but you can actually program this multiple times as long as you have the blank check turned off. Um, and that can actually help for reliability. And that's just because these programmers just don't always use the right voltage levels or whatever and programming multiple times can actually make the difference between it working in the system you're gonna use it in and not working. Anyways, three times, we should be good. All right, it's time to disassemble this computer. I have the uh, 70s towel down to keep any scratches off. I do have this note on here and this had to do with the way to plug this thing in. I know that pin one on my little connector is over on the left side. So I wanna make sure when I get this in here that I have it lined up properly. I wired it up in a way that if it's plugged in backwards, shouldn't cause any any harm. Incidentally, talking about this machine, since I uh, you know did the conversion of the voltage on the power supply, there have been no problems. This thing has run for many, many hours without any issue. All right, so we just lift up this little tray here to get to where the ROMs are. And this extra ROM chip is in here. So the weird thing is about this particular chip is that when I typed in the ROMs command at the beginning of this video, it didn't show that there was actually anything there. And actually, this is a 2764. It's not even the right size. These are 16K ROMs that are in here. And this is an 8K ROM. I mean, unless I'm mistaken. No, I'm pretty sure this is the wrong size chip. So it's kind of like, no wonder why. Um, it didn't work or it wouldn't show anything. What we need to have in here is this chip here, <laughs> which is a 16K EEPROM. Why don't I put some deoxid here first? And there we go, a little deoxid in the socket. Couldn't not do that in this video, right? I think people complain when I don't do it. It's kind of hilarious. I can't remember what these jumpers are here. I might need to go look that up. I mean, if this doesn't work, you know, we don't get the ROM working, then it could be that either I have this in the wrong socket or these jumpers need to be configured. Maybe this thing does support 8K. And let's see if um, that ROM I burned is actually visible to the OS. And I just noticed something before putting this thing back together. I put this thing in backwards. <laughs> that would have destroyed the chip. So people were probably like screaming at their screen, <laughs> watching me do it. But I have to tell you that that is one of the pitfalls of making videos. I am talking while doing this. Working on computers like this, I've sort of gotten used to this whole multitasking thing, talking while doing it. 
but it is easy to make mistakes like that. I mean, I know better not to put a chip in the wrong way, but for whatever reason, I put it in the wrong way. <laughs> in fact, let me double check one more time. Yeah, the notch is over here and then that matches everything else. So now it's in the right way. Alrighty, well, here we go. Let's turn this thing on. Okay, that sounds quite normal. So use uh, star ROMs as the command to see what's going on. Ah, we're not seeing anything here. Okay, I did a little bit of Googling here and he's talking about the ROM location here. So those are the four uh, sockets on the motherboard. And the first one is a one megabit ROM. So that's the operating system and whatnot, as I said. And at the center of the three sockets, 27, that one there, is vacant, then you put your ROM in that socket, making sure that the half moon notch of the chip is pointing towards the power supply. Then the next socket you use is 41 or 37. If you put your chip into IC socket 41, you'll need to change link 18. So that's that jumper right there to the west position. That would be to the left. If you put the chip in IC 37, you'll need to change to link 19, which is up there to the west position. Both of these links, three pin with a movable connector, link 18 is just above link 12, so make sure you don't confuse the two. And then you should be able to see the ROM visible in the ROM table by typing star ROMs. Well, according to that documentation, if you have the chip in this socket, you need to have that jumper over on the left. And if you have it in this one, you need to have that jumper on the left. Well, that one's on the left, so I'll move that one back to the right, and I'll put this into the middle socket here. All right, so we turn this back on. What do we get now? ROMs. There it is in ROM socket eight, master MMFS. <laughs> oh, cool. I, and I'm gonna have to go read the documentation, but I think it was MMFS to start it. So now it's kind of running or whatever. So like theoretically you can type commands and do stuff. Well, we don't have this thing hooked up, so that's not gonna work. So let's get that plugged in and see if I cause any any catastrophic damage to this computer. Luckily, 6522s, I do have some spares in case I cause carnage on this thing. Now this little carved out connector I made here isn't the right size exactly. So I just need to make sure that I have it on the pins correctly. So it is perfectly placed here. I'm gonna push it in using this tool here. There it is. This thing has plenty of length to come out the side like that. Power this up. Okay, uh, I didn't plug the video cable in. So that would result in no picture. <laughs> oh, it's scary because I haven't used this thing yet. Oh, there's an LED on there. Look at that. It is glowing red. Oh, it's really hard to see in the camera. There it is. There's a little red LED. That's from the voltage regulator. So that means that this thing is getting five volts. That is a very good sign. Now it's not an activity LED. It's just a power LED. According to the documentation here, there it is, star MMFS, uh, star disk, star disk with a C, with a K. And then you can use these commands, which are Acorn DFS commands, access, backup, close, copy, delete. All right, so star D drive. All right, that's good. <laughs> I don't know what, that's, what that means, but something's happening. List the drives which are currently inserted, plus their status. The documentation is comprehensive, I give it that, but it'd be nice if there was just like a, hey, here's a, like a tutorial on how to get started. Type these commands to like see what's on your SD card, stuff like that. I have found, as I'm a complete novice at all this stuff, that a lot of the posts and documentation are for people who had these computers and already are really familiar with them. There's not a lot of stuff for people like me who have never used these and I'm experiencing it for the first time. It probably comes from the fact that the people who are creating this stuff, the, the smart people making all these projects are really, really familiar with this machine. So they kind of forget what it's like to have zero knowledge about the, the computer and the command structure. So those commands would just make sense to someone who's already familiar with the structure. But someone like me who's not, and I'd, I've never used this DFS, this disk file system that would have been used with actual disk drives back in the day, I, I don't really know what to do. I guess I'm gonna try this deboot menu. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, that worked. That's so funny. <laughs> like it didn't just, <laughs> the documentation should just say, boot the disk using this command. <laughs> And it didn't say that. All right, here we are. Here is the menu. And yes, this should be in color. If you notice there's a little glitching, please ignore that. That is the open source scan converter just not doing a great job at this particular mode, which I think is called mode seven. It's like the teletext mode. Either way, um, how do I move up and down? Here it is, the arrow keys. 
So this is kind of telling me that the SD card is working here because pretty sure this is all coming off the SD card here. Now I think um, this has multiple pages, yes. Now I know, yeah, Arkanoid exists, there it is, T. So if I press enter on that, commands and <laughs> it loaded. Now I'm assuming we'd be hearing the sound. Oh, I guess it's in a different language. We'd be hearing the sound if the speaker were connected. Oh, it's freaking working. Okay, <laughs> this is great. This is so awesome. Let me hook the speaker back up. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it's loud. All right, I'm gonna unplug the speaker again because uh, that's just really loud. We know the sound is working. Okay, a couple of things going on here. It's freaking working, so this is awesome. My super cheap SD card interface here, which was literally made with parts I had lying around the basic, cost me nothing to make. I, I probably bought this SD card interface seven, eight years ago, I don't remember. Uh, that works, <laughs> it's so cool. And it loads really quickly as well, that's, that's really neat. Okay, so Arkanoid is running, but it's in black and white. And the reason why it's in black and white is because this motherboard only sends a black and white image to the composite output jack, because I think it's designed for like high resolution monochrome monitors. You would use the RGB monitor if you wanted color, and then you could also hook up a color TV to the composite output through the RF modulator. Well, there is no way for me to hook up anything to this RF modulator here because uh, that's gonna be a PAL type RF signal, which I don't have any kind of display at all that could display that. Now I hear people saying, well, you have RGB, which is this jack here, just use that. You don't need to actually you know, do composite for color. The thing is, I wanna have that as an option. And in the UK, you would just plug a TV in here and then you could do that. Well, I wanna be able to test to see if I can get color out of this jack. So I think I'm gonna take a look at the schematics and figure out how to reroute the color signal that would normally be going to this, to this jack right here. Because clearly the circuitry exists on the motherboard to convert the RGB signal, which is probably what comes out of some of these ICs here, to that color composite and then send it out this jack. So let's, let's try that. Now what I really love is the community has recreated the schematics for this computer here. So it's like super duper high quality here. Take a look at that, really nice. So much better than like the bad scans you have for a lot of these other computers. So it's a two page schematic and this section right here is the video output section. So there's the RGB output. Now there's the RF modulator and there is the video output. Now we take a look at the video output here. It has a buffer transistor, which means that like it's a buffer signal, which is the right way to do it. And we take a look at what's going into the gate. So these resistors here are what go into the gate. And if we follow these traces up here, these make their way over to this section right here, which is the RGB. See, the RGB goes into these three transistors, it outputs here, comes down there, and it goes into these resistors, which then basically goes into this buffer and creates the monochrome signal. Now it is mixed also with a composite sync, which is right there, that is mixed in through this 1K resistor, and that also goes in there. That is why we have a monochrome image, because those RGB levels are simply created or creating different grayscale levels because take a look at these resistors, 2K2, 1K, and a 3K9. So the RGB levels are gonna mix to create um, different levels. And when you have white, it's R, G, and B all combined. And you have all three of these combined to go into this um, circuit here. And they've designed it to output like a whatever, a one volt peak to peak type signal, which is white over composite video. Now taking a look at the RF modulator, it uses a completely separate video circuit entirely. This entire section here is not connected to this upper area. It has a similar setup. There are the three levels going into a transistor here, which go into this V1 input on the RF modulator. But it also has this buffer right here, which is combined into that same output. And if we follow that over to here, there's this thing called a chroma chip, which is obviously the PAL color encoder. And it has a bunch of outputs here, which have a bunch of different value resistors. And that goes through an inductor and a capacitor into that gate of that transistor. And that's gonna be the chroma signal and it gets mixed in with the composite video. And in fact, are these values the same? Uh, 2K2, 1K and 3K9. Yeah, so same exact value for the luminance levels, which is what this section is. Um, but this is gonna be different. You might be thinking, oh, you could just take this video one signal right here and put that into the jack. I'm not so sure about that. We should hook up the oscilloscope to this pin here, but I bet you it's not gonna be a standard signal. It's not gonna have the normal voltage ranges we're gonna expect. And you can kind of tell that because it's got this like pull down resistor here over the 3K9 down to ground. 
And if we take a look at the output right here, this doesn't have any pull down resistor, which is correct. It has a 68 ohm resistor, which is a little off spec. It should be 75 ohms for terminated composite video. And what happens is the video signal comes out of the computer, goes into your monitor or TV or whatever it's hooked up to. And in that device, it is then terminated or pulled down to ground at 75 ohms. So I think the right thing to do here is get the oscilloscope out. Let's take a look at what's on V1 and let's see about what this signal even looks like. And then what parts can I lift right here to disconnect this section and then mix it in over here. Okay, the oscilloscope probe is connected right here to the V1 input on the RF modulator. That's a V1 right there. All right, so right off the bat, we could see that this is an inappropriate signal to go to a composite monitor because it's got a whole bunch of DC in there. It doesn't have like a ton of DC. It wouldn't like damage the monitor, but the video signal that's there, um, well, that's just not looking right. So if we zoom in a little bit, we can see like the sync pulse right there and there's a color burst. In fact, if we pause this, there it is. So there's the color burst happening. So sync pulse, color burst. And if we do single shots here, we should get some like line information. There we go. So that's like text showing up. So this on a normal composite video signal should be, I think, uh, what is it? One volt peak to peak. So from the bottom of the sync pulse there to the very top of the, the brightest white, you should have one volt. So we're actually at one volt per division right now. And we take a look at this. It's not so bad, like the way this video signal looks. It's about the right amplitude. But let's just take a look at what the video signal looks like on the um, composite jack right here. And let's compare. So we'll do single shots on this and we'll do single shots. Okay, so there it is. Now, interesting is this actually has, this has DC voltage on it as well. Most TVs and monitors are gonna like filter that out. So it's not the end of the world. I just changed the scope to be AC coupled and we're 200 millivolts per division. So there's the sync pulse, there's the text. Notice there's no color burst if we do single shots here. So we have no color burst anymore. And that's because remember, this is the monochrome signal and that color burst comes from this section up here, it's injected into it. Okay, first off, I'm gonna do exactly what I said I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lift R131 and I'm gonna lift, lift R145. That should leave us on V1 with simply the chroma information. We should have no more sync and no more video information. Because I'm gonna leave R146 for now, that means there still should be normal amplitude. We should see the color burst and any other color information that might be encoded. That'll look like little sine waves. <laughs> Alrighty, there we go. I lifted R131 and R145 and I'm back on the V1 pin. And as you can see there, we simply have a color burst and doing a single shot, there it is. That's the color burst, 4.59-ish megahertz, which I guess is the, the PAL color burst. NTSC would be like 3.54-ish, something like that. So cool. Okay, so that worked. Now placing the cursors gives us a peak to peak voltage of about 390 millivolts. To be honest, I don't remember what a color burst should be, but uh, the monitors are pretty forgiving to be honest. So we can just jam this signal, I think, into this composite signal right here. The 47 picofarad cap here is what sort of separates the color circuit from the luminance circuit. All right, what I've done is I disconnected the V1 input on the RF modulator. And I know you can't really see this close up, but I will show a close up once we're done here of, of all the mods I've done. Uh, but uh, on, the, on the schematic here, I lifted V1, but I left R146 connected. And then I have this little jumper lead installed between this point right here. So the right side of C88, and it is connected to the composite on R139 on the left side of it. So not the side facing the jack, but it's actually gonna put the chroma signal through the 68 ohm resistor. So let's turn the machine on now, see what we see. We are not seeing any chrominance signal whatsoever. Interesting. So I think what's happening is the output of this is connected through five volts here through 1500 ohms and plus another 10 ohms. And then it goes to ground at 3K9. And I think that's just not strong enough because this one here is driving the signal at 68 ohms. And I think that's just a lot stronger than that other signal. So as soon as I connect it together, it just sort of obliterates the chroma signal altogether. Uh, okay, so I was just looking at the schematics and I noticed here, LK11, not fitted. And uh, there's, a, there's a capacitor there and we follow this trace and it goes right here. Oh man, so right there, this is how you do color on this machine. You just install a jumper right there. It was designed this way from the very start. All this rigmarole that I was doing was completely pointless and totally going down the wrong path anyways. 
Well, for the life of me, I looked everywhere high and low for this jumper link and that capacitor, and it's just not on this board. So what I decided to do is just replicate what this does by connecting a capacitor between this point right here on the schematic and this point right here. That'll do exactly the same thing. Now, one way to do that is to take the board out of the case and connect to the emitter here on Q12 and then connect to the base here on Q13 because that's what the jumper link is actually doing. See, it connects there and brings it down there. Well, put a capacitor between those two legs, but you can actually do that from the top side of the board as well, which is what I went ahead and did. The capacitor is installed right here on the board. I'll show where that is closer up in a second. But if you take a look at R147 on the right side, that's obviously where this is connecting here. You can connect it also to R151 on the side that faces the base. And up here on the chroma circuit, you have two resistors, which will be on the top side, easy to solder to, R130 and R118. You just need to make sure you have it on the correct side. Now things are looking a little bit messy on the board there, but if I tilt it up, you can kind of see that I have it soldered onto the left side of the fourth resistor down right there. And I have it on the right side of the second resistor down, ignoring this uh, larger brown resistor. If you count that one, it's three down. I ended up talking to my friend Tony about the mod I'm doing here. And he said, oh yeah, plenty of people have done this mod before. And the reason why the schematics didn't match what I'm seeing on this board is because there are two different revisions of this motherboard. And I must have the earlier issue one revision, which doesn't have that jumper link. Apparently there's a master issue two board that does have simply a jumper link you can install to enable color. Tony actually did the same mod on his board, but he did it by removing the board and installing the capacitor on the underside between the base and the emitter of those two transistors. One of the reasons why I like doing it on the top side is A, it's very easy and very quick if you're trying to do this mod yourself, but B, uh, you can simply run some wires over here to this switch, which currently is used for the battery, but I think we're gonna take care of that later. And then I can switch the color on and off. The reason why you'd wanna do that is because if you're using a monochrome monitor hooked up to the machine, like a CRT or something like that, any type of color video signal on that monitor will show up with a dot pattern inside of it, which is a little bit unsightly and takes away from some of the sharpness and clarity of the text or graphics. So having an external toggle switch like I have right here would just be a convenient way to switch in and out of color mode. All right, so let's take a look to see how this looks now. We'll turn on the computer. All right, so right off the bat, you can tell the text is a little bit, I don't know, color fringed and not as sharp. And that is again, because that color signal is there, even though that text is just white text, there's no actual color to it. Having that color encoded signal mixed in there causes a little bit of artifacting. So let's boot up to the SD card. And I did figure out by the way that I can do dboot zero because the menu was in slot zero. And there we go, it actually loaded up and take a look, it's in color now. Now I did a little bit of reading on some of the forums and I found some other posts about people talking about doing mods like this to this machine. And everyone seemed to conclude that the color output or the color composite output is just not super great. It's not very sharp and it's kind of washed out looking. And yeah, sure enough, uh, there's a lot of dot crawl here and it doesn't look wonderful. For looking at the color we're getting now, let's look at this 3D Wars demo. Don't really know what this is. Ah, look at that. All right, yeah, I mean, the color's not super vibrant, but it's there. I wonder if that square is supposed to be like that. And I don't know if I should be able to move the ship around. Maybe if you have a joystick connected, doesn't seem like any of the keys do anything. But either way, it's cool to see that this color mod does work and to disable it would be as simple as disconnecting that capacitor. And that's a really quick and easy mod for these original BBC Master 128s. You might have noticed so far that every time I reboot this computer, even though I have this SD card ROM in here, it doesn't automatically select that ROM. I have to actually type the command star MMFS. I think I can actually fix that. So I went to the reference manual for the BBC master and the star configure or star CO dot command will actually allow you to set up those CMOS settings in the machine. And one of the parameters is the file parameter. It says it defines the default filing system by means of the ROM socket number. Now back on the system, if I type in star ROMs, now the slots zero through F, which is the same as zero through 15, we'll notice that ADFS is in slot D, which is slot 13. Now, if we type status to look at what the parameters are currently set to, the file one is set to 13. So we should be able to change that to configure file, and we're gonna do eight because that is where the master MMFS ROM is stored. Now, if I hit control break to reset the computer, now the Acorn MMFS is what loaded, so that's perfect. That means that I don't have to type that command anymore to get the system to, to load. Now, to get the disk to boot, I have to type that star dboot command, right? And I think I can type zero. 
which will boot up into the menu here. Now we can actually make it where that happens automatically as well. And there's a similar command. So we do configure and you just type boot, oops, boot. And now if I hit control break, it actually auto boots the system. Now, the thing is if we hit control break, it's gonna auto boot every time. But I think if I hit shift break, that boots back into basic because apparently using the shift break is like the opposite of the boot command. So if we go back and we type configure, and we do no boot, and now I hit control break, boots back into basic, but if I hit shift break, it will actually boot the disk automatically. Now, I, think, I guess that's the same as for the disk file system and the advanced disk file system. It just allows you to selectively boot or not by using that shift key. Now I'm noticing there's one other issue right now with this system, and if I do this, notice the Acorn Moss there is almost off the top of the screen. I don't think that's quite right. So if we look at status, oops, status, down at the bottom there's that TV command. Now I took a look in the manual as well, and that first digit, which is currently zero, allows you to move the entire image up and down vertically. So we should be able to configure that. So we go TV and positive values of zero actually make it go higher up that way, up towards the top, and negative numbers will make it go down. Now the manual did say it's a signed integer, which means if we do 255, that's gonna be the same thing as negative one, it's a signed eight bit number. And the one, by the way, has to do with interlaced or non-interlaced, one means non-interlaced. So we do that and we hit control break, and there we go. And now if we go down to the bottom, I think it should have shifted everything one line down, Perfect, now this looks really good. So if I hit shift break, should auto boot, looks good. Yeah, I'm finally getting the hang of this thing. Just, just ever so slightly, I'm getting the hang of this computer. I gotta say, I kinda love it. It's really, it's really quite cool. Now the BBC Micro, which of course is the more common of these machines, it does not have NVRAM on it. It doesn't have a CMOS or a battery or something. So I think these configure commands and stuff like that are very specifically for the master, but that's what makes this computer that much better than BBC Micro is because it's a little bit more evolved and you can configure what mode, text mode the machine goes into and like all these other things that we can see here in the status. Before people yell at me, I'm just gonna install a little sticker over the EEPROM window there for MMFS because people are gonna be like, your EEPROM's gonna get erased, oh no. Anyways, that sticker on there will help, but of course, the lid on this computer is gonna help as well. And there's, there's really not gonna be an issue with that. All right, next up, why don't we take this EEPROM that was in this computer, this uh, 2764, and let's see if anything's even on this. Like what, what was that before that wasn't even working? Let's just hit read in the EEPROM programmer here and we'll see what we got. Hey, we actually do have code here of some kind, but what? The fact that these are repeating patterns kind of makes me think, um, hmm, is that text? No, kind of looks like a character set, maybe something like that, like a font. Not quite sure. I don't really recognize it. If you happen to recognize what this might be, let me know. But perhaps these were some kind of assets used for some software that was run on this thing off a disk or something like that. Not too sure. Well, the next thing I want to take a look at is something I noticed on the schematics here that may or may not be anything. So this is the chroma chip, right? This is what generates the PAL color signal that gets mixed into the composite video now to give us that color. Take a look at this jumper right here though, LK15, it says NPAL. I'm wondering if there's a possibility that this particular chroma encoder actually has an NTSC mode, and this would be like NTSC or PAL, depending on how this jumper is set. Now for encoding proper NTSC color signal, you're gonna need the correct crystal oscillator. And if we look over here, here's the crystal oscillator, 17.7345 megahertz, that's the typical PAL one. And the NTSC one is gonna be like 14 point whatever. Essentially they divide down to that 4.43 for PAL or 3.54 for NTSC color frequency. So I'm kind of wondering if it's possible that I could change this jumper setting and change this crystal to get a NTSC color signal. The computer, of course, would be outputting a 50 hertz video signal, so that would not change. And that's needed because there are more lines in the graphics modes on this machine than are, than are possible in NTSC. But the thing is, here in North America, most of the CRT display monitors that exist out there cannot support PAL color encoding. So if I plug this computer in through composite video, I'm gonna get a monochrome signal. But what they do support is a 50 hertz signal that has NTSC encoding. You can call that NTSC 50. It's very non-standard, but it is actually possible that it could work. 
So the question is, is this jumper LK15 actually visible or populated on this board? And is it really connected to pin two? After that whole thing with this LK11 not actually existing on this board, I'm a little hesitant to uh, think that these things are gonna be configured exactly like this, but it's easy enough to find this chip here, IC40, and then just look at what pin two is connected to. Now looking at the board here, IC40 is this one right here. It's a little small TI chip, and there is the jumper that on the board is LK15 or the schematics. Now I did some Googling for this part number, TAHC03 and also CF30060, and I didn't find anything. So I'm assuming this is some type of a custom chip that was manufactured for Acorn by TI. All right, so the first thing we need to do is figure out this pin two here and see if it's actually connected to these three pads right here. And it looks like the middle pad is the one that probably goes to pin two. And then this one here is ground. Yes, it is. And this one right here is five volts. And that is exactly what it is. So I don't actually see any traces on the top side of the board. That means that it must be on the underside. And what I'm gonna do is I think I need to remove this board from the case now. And then I'm gonna install uh, some pins there. That means I can jumper this either way, cut that trace on the bottom side, and then we'll see what this, this actually does. Maybe we can get NTSC out of this thing. And while I have this out, I'm actually gonna kind of clean up the mess I made over here, fiddling around with those uh, resistors and stuff. Just make it look a little cleaner. Alrighty, there it is. The jumper's installed. I have the one in the right position. And I also went ahead and I socketed the crystal oscillator. So this is the uh, PAL crystal there, 17 point whatever megahertz. I put a little socket in the motherboard there. Hopefully this all works as it is there. This is a trimmer for this uh, particular oscillator. If this works, uh, everything should be still PAL right now. And then we can try switching this jumper and putting a different crystal in here, see what happens. You may be noticing I also did a couple other mods. I socketed this IC, which I'll get to why I did that in a second. And I also cut this wire here. So that goes to uh, the capacitor here, which I'll do in just a second. Alrighty, let's see what happens here. Hopefully the computer still works. Let's see what happens. All right, this is not a language. Of course, the battery's unplugged, so we've lost the CMOS settings. Completely understandable. Holding down Control D and brake just drops us into the command prompt. Now there's no basic here because we have to configure uh, the language, Lang, and I think it's 12. Control D break, there we go, now we're in basic. And I configured the file to use the MMFFs. Okay, so I don't have the SD card plugged in right now, but are we getting color is the question uh, with this crystal oscillator in the socket here. So I do have to change this to composite because obviously we're not gonna get any color there. It seems we have no color working right now. I think we should be like showing blue text right now. We're getting nothing. Alrighty, there we go. All it took was a little bit of an adjustment on this potentiometer here. I'll do it again just to kind of demonstrate here. If I turn this a little bit, we lose the color altogether. But there's a little bit of a range here where it's nice and solid and works properly. We're back to where we were, where we have functional color. I can remove this clip here. If I change this jumper over to the other position, we lose the color. Now, this is a question of, if I switch the crystal oscillator out, will we get NTSC color? Now, here's the thing. The RetroTINK itself does not support NTSC at 50 hertz. It, it doesn't understand what's going on <laughs> and it doesn't work. But the thing is, regular monitors like the Commodore 1084 does work that way. So I gotta grab a 1084 and grab a crystal oscillator and let's give this a test. All right, well, you see, I have the BBC connected here to the 1084, it's over composite. It's not gonna have any color. So uh, let's see, we'll make sure we're in mode one. And if we go color one, yeah, so we got, you know, monochrome or grayscale for the color. And that's because this doesn't support PAL, this NTSC US version. Now the question is, if I turn the computer off and I switched out the crystal, I grabbed one here, it's 14 point whatever megahertz. It is the normal NTSC frequency put this into the board here, turn this on. Let's see what we get. Now I do have the jumper on the other selection already here. Mode one, color two. We have freaking color. <laughs> I can't even believe that. Wow, this is so crazy and I love it. Look, there's red text <laughs> over composite. <laughs> So what we're doing here is we are outputting NTSC, but 
we're outputting it at 50 hertz. So I have the camera set for 1 50th of a second, but we have freaking color text. I can't believe oh, this, this actually works. I think the right thing to do here is to connect up the SD card uh, and watch it boot. Cause that had, you know, I could run games and stuff. We could see actual color. <laughs> oh, this is pretty funny. I have the SD interface connected. If I hit shift break, should boot up and there it is. Wow, everything is sort of shifted over to one side. That's interesting. Uh, but either way, we have absolute color text and color everything. Let's try that 3D Wars demo. That was what we were looking at before. I wonder why it's all shifted over. Very interesting. But freaking color displayed on a North American display. That's just so awesome. Now, of course, it goes without saying, you need a monitor that can display 50 hertz. Not all of them can do it. And then you need a monitor that can display 50 hertz with NTSC encoding, which is completely non-standard. And as I said, the retro tank itself will not support that. And even my Sony broadcast monitor doesn't support it. But it seems like dumb televisions, like ones that aren't as sophisticated, for instance, uh, they do work fine. The 1084 works fine. That little Sony nine inch TV that I RGB modded, that works fine. My Toshiba sitting over here does not work. Well, it would work, but the problem is, is it does not handle 50 Hertz. When you read the data sheet for the jungle in the Toshiba uh, TV, it actually has a setting that's controlled over I squared C that does enable it to have a wider vertical refresh rate. And unfortunately the microcontroller that's on that TV sets it up to only work at around 60 Hertz. And that is in the Sony, the same thing. It comes out of the box only supporting around 60 Hertz but I talked about in the RGB mod video, a way to change that in the service menu to then support from about 49 Hertz all the way to like 62 Hertz. And it absolutely works perfectly with this. And that means that it will support this, this fake NTSC 50 Hertz color. The BBC Micro Model B was released in North America and it ran fully NTSC. The problem is with that particular machine is that it changed the graphics modes where I think they only had like 200 lines of graphics capability and that made software that was designed for the PAL versions incompatible. I think they would run fast, but that's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is that these games are using all of those extra lines that PAL has over NTSC. Now the BBC Master was never released with NTSC in mind, at least from what I can tell, but clearly they had this being released here in the US in mind when they designed it and then Acorn just folded up shop in the US and, and it never actually got sold here. But that's clearly why that chip has that pin on it. And there's even those jumpers are there on the motherboard, although they're hardwired on the bottom side. So that kind of shows that they had put that into the original design and then just decided, you know, never mind. Now this mod is not gonna be for everyone, obviously, both of these mods, the co color composite mod and this NTSC 50 mod. And that's of course, because with RGB, you can hook that up to any of these monitors like this one, and you're gonna get color image at 50 Hertz, no problems. But where this mod is extra useful is if you have a North American CRT, like a 1702, it doesn't have RGB. And with these mods, you can hook this up to that set and you're gonna get a color display on it. So. It just makes this machine a little bit more versatile here in North America, the way it is. It's my understanding that because this uses a 6845 CRTC, a CRT controller, it is possible to actually get full 60 Hertz NTSC modes out of this with those limitations of the reduced scan lines, which sort of breaks the compatibility. I think it would be a change to the ROMs on this that would do that. If anyone's aware of ROMs for the BBC Master that actually runs it in NTSC frequencies, definitely let me know because that would bring this machine all the way to full NTSC mode. And of course, this one's already been modded for 120 volts. So yeah, this would be essentially the North American BBC Master that was never actually released. I don't mind though leaving this as it is right now in this particular configuration because this gives me the 100% compatibility with all the PAL based software, but then still the ability to use it on the monitors and stuff as I already talked about. All right, next up, I wanna hook this toggle switch here. I strip the wires. I'm gonna hook it up to that capacitor. So I'm just gonna lift one leg, put some heat shrink on there and just route it through this toggle switch. All right, the switch is hooked up. I have it hooked up to the retro tank, which clearly is not gonna display any color but if we boot up into the SD card here, so when the switch is in the down position, it's monochrome, so there should be nice sharpness, uh, no dots or anything like that. And when I flip it up, well, 
okay, it's having a problem now because that's the retro tank, but you can see all the dots there, which is definitely the color information. And I tested on the Commodore 1084, which is sitting here right next to me, and it works absolutely perfectly. In fact, when I have the computer set to monochrome mode with a switch down and I plug the connector into the back of the monitor and set it for Luma Chroma, the text is super duper sharp, 80 columns. It looks amazing. Now you might be asking, originally I was using this switch here for the battery connection, which I had connected right here. Well, I realized that I don't even think a battery is needed on this computer, an external battery that is. Now you're probably asking, especially if you're familiar with the BBC master line of machines, how is that possible that you don't need a battery? Well, the reason why is this is the clock chip right here. And I socketed that earlier, oops, wrong way. And you can see there it's a Hitachi HD 146818. This is a pretty common NVRAM clock chip that's used on many, many PC motherboards. And that got me thinking, on PC motherboards that use this chip, there are a whole slew of clock chips that are pin compatible with this chip, and not all of them require an external battery connection. The version of a clock chip that fits into the same pinout as this, that doesn't require an external battery, is the Dallas Semiconductor DS1287, or whatever it's called. All those original Dallas chips from the old days are no longer functional. And for a while they were making, well, there were still new old stock ones you could buy. And there may still be some to this day, but the problem is they haven't been manufactured in a number of years, which means the little internal lithium battery, it's like a CR2032 or something like that in there, has slowly been running down, even while it's parked on the shelf. Luckily, the community has come through and we have aftermarket replacements. So in this bag, I have a couple of those such chips. The one on my left here, I removed from a PC that I took apart ages ago. And uh, as far as I'm aware, this is just pin compatible with this Hitachi chip. And this was designed to replace those Dallas Semiconductor chips. Now looking at the bottom here, we have a barcode and uh, LP787. If anyone recognizes this, let me know, but I don't really know where that came from. But what we have here, is a modern replacement of the Dallas chip as well. This is open source by Necroware. If you've seen Necroware's channel, he's really good at fixing PC motherboards, and he has designed several awesome little adapters for fixing old PCs and has released them open source. So a viewer at some point sent me a couple of the boards, and I have two of them here, and I assembled them. They are pretty easy to put together, surface mount. There is the little crystal oscillator on the bottom, so these don't even need an external crystal. And you can see uh, there's the surface mount chip and there's a battery holder on the top because these things run for a very, very long time with one of those three volt cells. Let's take a look at the different data sheets for these two chips just to confirm that they look really similar. So this is the pinout for the Hitachi chip that's actually on this machine right now. We have the oscillator pins right here, one and two. We have the address data bus lines right there. Chip enables down here, read writes down there, and a few other functions. So let's check out the Dallas chip. This is it here, it's made by Maxim now, or it was at least. And maybe they still sell replacements of these, I don't know. And actually, they don't make the DS1287s anymore, they make the 12887s, which is a direct replacement. Here's a table here that shows the P-DIP pinout, which are E-DIP pinout, I assume one of these is probably the same. Uh, P-DIP here, pin one is MOT. That's just not connected on the Hitachi chip. Two and three are the oscillator. So two and three are the oscillator, that makes sense. And then four through 11, our address data bus is there. Four through 11, address and data bus is here. I hope you're getting an idea that things are just basically identical. Pin 13 is chip select. Pin 13 is chip select. So yeah, these chips are all interchangeable. Back in the day, there were just a whole bunch of clock chips that were all cross compatible with each other on the same motherboards. And the real difference was when you plugged in the Dallas module, you didn't need to worry about that external power connection while with these Satachi chips you did. And I worked on plenty of PC motherboards that had provisions for the battery and stuff like that. But while the Dallas chip was in there, they didn't even install the battery holder and they left a couple passive components off. Now you might be asking, why am I even bothering with this? What was wrong with this CR2032 battery and the clock chip that was on this board? Well, I did some calculations and I think the problem is, is that chip is rather old and it kind of draws a lot of current out of this battery. And that means that I calculated that this battery is actually only gonna last, I don't know, less than a year hooked up to that clock chip. Well, the main difference is, is that this clock chip here with this little tiny battery that this takes, which um, I have a couple of them there, they're just like little tiny coin cells, 
Well, they don't leak, first of all, and the surface mount chip that's on here is designed to run for a very, very long time, probably like 10 years without needing a battery replacement. And when the battery does die, I don't have to worry about it leaking. Not that there's much of a worry about this particular battery leaking, but if I went back to that battery pack with those larger batteries, absolutely, I don't wanna put stuff like those in my computers. So let's give one of these a try in this machine. These are untested, by the way. I assembled these and haven't actually tried them in anything, so I don't really know if they're gonna work, but let's just go for it and install this in the computer. So out comes the original Hitachi clock chip, and that's why I socketed it earlier. Socketed it, socketed it. And let's pop this in just like that. Pops right in super easily. I have a couple batteries right here. These are CR1225s. I would definitely like to thank whichever viewer sent these in to me at some point in the past. I don't remember who that was. All right, so we turn this on. Obviously we're not gonna have any, oh, we got a weird error there, but that's fine. That's just because it's corrupted data. So I'm gonna hold down the R key, turn this on. We'll hit break to continue. All right, so it did a reset, but it still says terminal. So I'm gonna say that this chip is not working in here. We have the file as 15, we have Lang as 15. So I don't really know if this is actually gonna work, but let's just give it a try and see if it can actually write to this chip. And I'm gonna hit control break and it went right back to terminal. And clearly this either isn't working, like it's uh, like I didn't assemble it properly, or it is just not compatible uh, with the BBC here. So let's give this other one a try. I'll just leave it with the battery disconnected. CMOS RAM reset, break to continue, and no, nope, not working, okay. Well, it could well be that I assembled both of those incorrectly. So let's try this one here, which I took out of a working computer. All right, ROM reset. No, interesting, interesting, interesting. I'm gonna have to go look at the schematics to see exactly why these aren't working. I popped in the original Hitachi chip again. Let's just make sure that it's working as it should. Okay, yeah, this is not a language. That's a bit more like I would expect. Now holding down the R key, when we power this up, we should get that reset again. There it is, reset, press break. Okay, yeah, that is the default settings for the ROM, not what we were getting on the other ones. I spent the next several minutes double checking all the schematics and the pinouts of both chips just to make sure that there was no difference on the motherboard that would cause the chip not to work. To summarize what I found is that everything should be fully compatible between the Dallas chip and the Hitachi chip that was in the motherboard. I came over here to Necroware's GitHub repo and I was hoping to find schematics <laughs> and there's no schematics. There's KiCad files here, so you can load these into KiCad. So I have KiCad open here. Let's see if any of this opens properly. All right, well, there's the PCB itself. So that's the actual traces. All right, and I was able to open the schematic. It's not a whole lot to see because, uh, well, it's just using labels here to connect everything together. The one thing I'm thinking might be the problem here because everything looks like it should be fine is pin one here, no connected. And on the motherboard doesn't seem to be connected to anything either. When we look at the data sheet for the Dallas chip, pin one is Motorola or Intel bus timing selector. The pin selects one of two bus types. When connected to VCC, Motorola bus timing is selected. When connected to ground or left disconnected, Intel bus timing is selected. The pin has an internal pull down resistor. Looking here at KiCad, that pin is actually connected to something that says Motorola. So that's that mode selector switch. And I'm just wondering if I need to ground that or pull it up, probably pull it up to five volts to see if that makes this chip start to work with this machine. According to the data sheet for the Hitachi chip, it seems to be talking about that as for a 6800 peripheral, which implies the Motorola chips. Although it says it can connect to an 8085, so that's an Intel chip. Looking at the Hitachi data sheet, here is the bus timing, and it says 6801, so Motorola timing. And if we look at the Intel chip or the Dallas chip, this all looks very similar, actually. This is in Motorola mode, and then there's Intel mode right here, but this also has Intel mode, and it looks very, very similar as well. But what I don't get is how do you select which mode you're in here with a Hitachi chip because it pin one is not connected to anything. Oh, I found this. This is a section about how the Hitachi chip selects the different bus type. And it seems to use the AS, AS, E latch the state of the pin. It automatically indicates which processor is connected. All right, so that might be the problem right there is that I think, I think 
This one defaults to Intel timing, which means I need to try pulling up pin one to five volts, and let's see if that makes any difference. All right, pin one hooked up to five volts. I'm holding down R for reset. Reset, done. Oh, ho, ho. yes, that was it. That was it. That's the trick you need to do to get this thing working. All right, so we can break out of that. We should be able to configure a few things. There we go with those three commands. That should be good enough. And it worked. Let's turn the computer off. And I guess I just have to wait a little while <laughs> to see if this works, but this should definitely work. And all I'm gonna need to do is just put a little jumper on the top of the board here, and that should make this work. I'm gonna turn it back on here. Let's just see if this works. Is it gonna work? Oh, it's freaking working. Okay, sweet. Let me install an actual permanent bodge wire. All right, there we have it. I connected pin 24 to pin one. I just little, used a little off cut from something and that should be it. This computer now has a leak free battery that should last like 10 years. And I don't need to connect anything up to this battery connector over here. Let's power this on and we should boot straight into basic. Maybe, yes, it works. <laughs> it freaking works. I love this. I absolutely love this. And those are all the mods I wanna do to this machine right now. So the next step is I'm just gonna reassemble this thing put a little hot glue on this SD card thing here to protect it. And then let's give this thing a full on test with it all back together. And here it is, the BBC Master 128, all back together and looking fantastic. I won't need this, which is the disk drive with that floppy disk I was using in the previous video. And that of course is because there's an SD card interface adapter on this and it's not coming out of either side because I actually use some blue tack to just stick it on the underside of this computer to keep it tucked out of the way. So let's turn this thing on. Watch the boot up process. There it is. Now, as we showed before, I just have to hit shift to break and that will boot off the SD card. And as you can see, we are looking at monochrome over composite video. But if I just reach back here, flip the switch. There we go, we have color. Let's run the game Chucky Egg, which everyone says is pretty much required for me to run on the BBC. Uh, press stop on tape. I've noticed a couple of things about running software on this. Some games load up and there's corrupt characters on screen or some don't seem to work at all. I did a little asking around and I can't quite figure out exactly what's going on, whether there's a fault with this machine or it's an incompatibility with the software. I think I've come to the conclusion though that it's an incompatibility with the ROM that's in here. This is running MOS or Machine Operating System 3.2 and apparently the 3.5, which was the latest version that this ran, improved compatibility quite a bit. So maybe that'll be a future video where I try to upgrade that ROM to something a little newer so I get some better compatibility. Now, while I'm excited that I have color video capability over composite video here in North America, let's be honest. This computer has RGB and I should be using an RGB video cable. So I went and found my SCART cable and I took the SCART connector off and I added a DE9 or a nine pin connector here. And I wired this up to be the same pinout for any analog nine pin connector used on something like the Commodore 1084. Any of the 1084s will work. I have this plugged into the back of the computer and I'll just plug this into the back of the monitor. I ended up retaining the 220 ohm, I think there's 220 ohm resistors that were on the original SCART cable to bring the, I don't know, TTL type levels for the RGB down to the analog levels required by a monitor like this. And inside the monitor, pushing the switch, <laughs> there we go. Wow, that looked a lot better than the composite video. I've talked about this enough time, but pointing the camera at a CRT just looks pretty junky. But the reality is this looks really, really nice, extra sharp. Clearly, if you have one of these Acorn machines, RGB is absolutely the way you want to go. It looks so much better than the composite video does. And I think we're at the end of this video. In fact, we're going to be at the end of this video series right now. I don't think I'm going to make any more videos about this machine specifically, at least for the short term. I got a whole bunch of other videos in the pipeline and I need to start working on other stuff. I wanna give a huge thanks to George for sending this machine in though. I, it's pretty special to have a machine like this here in North America. I'm sure there are other people who have these who have imported them or had them for years, 
but there can't be that many of them. And I especially am excited about the fact that this one has been modified by me to not only run on 120 volts, but output NTSC color as well. So it's a little bit closer to a version that might have been sold if Acorn never closed up shop here in North America. But that's water under the bridge. Acorn did close up shop, and I don't think they sold any BBC Masters. So this might be one of the only ones that's modified like this here in North America. I also want to give a shout out to Tony over at Oz Retro Comp. That's a YouTube channel. Tony's been helping me out with uh, questions and stuff as I've gone through this. In fact, the game pack that I'm running on that SD card come from Tony. So thanks very much, Tony, for all your help along the way with this machine. I've gotten a little bit frustrated now and then by the lack of information or being able to find stuff on this machine. And Tony's been able to uh, give me some tips and pointers. He's got several videos on a BBC Master as well that he modified and he lives in Australia. So uh, yeah, it's kind of cool to have help from the other side of the planet on a machine that's sort of out of place, probably in Australia and also here in North America. Although I think this machine was actually sold in Australia or at least used in schools and stuff. So it's a little less out of place there than it is here. I do want to talk about the monitor situation really quick. Obviously, I'm using a Commodore 1084 here. I have that Acorn monitor, that North American Acorn branded monitor, and I'm sure people wanted to see me using that thing with this. The problem is, is that uses a strange Japanese style connector for the analog video input. And while I have a cable that connects to that connector, the cable I have is for TTL video, so like CGA, and I use that with the Panasonic TV that I have upstairs. And that has horizontal and vertical sync, and this computer outputs a composite sync signal, so I don't think it's going to work. So I'm going to have to try to figure out how that all works, and maybe that'll be a second channel video. Anyhow, I think that's it. Yeah, it's been a fun journey. I love this computer. It's really exciting to get it working, to see it running and everything, to use BBC Basic and to learn some of those commands. My familiarity with the Acorn computers now means I'm ready to tackle my BBC Micros. I have two Model Bs that I need to make sure are working properly. And I think combine the two machines into one really nice mint condition machine because like one of them has a big hole in the case and stuff like that. And then I also have an Acorn Electron that was donated by a viewer a ways back. And I think that machine has some faults. So I'm gonna need to troubleshoot it and get it working, but it's, you know, a miniaturized cost reduced version of this computer really. So I think I have a lot of good knowledge now on how these acorns work and that'll really help me out with those other machines. If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Subscribe if you haven't already. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos, stuff like that. Link in the description below if you wanna become a patron. And finally, put comments down below if you have any thoughts about this series and tips and tricks about the, the acorn machines would be really appreciated, especially when it comes to the compatibility issues I was seeing with the corrupted characters and stuff on this machine. We're trying to upgrade to the MOS 3.5, actually fix that problem. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. So anyhow, I think that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.